Welcome in. I'm Tim Hill with Tan Books. Honored to be joined by Father Chad Ripiger and Dan Schneider, uh, author of the new book, The Liber Christo Method. And uh, guys, I I certainly am nowhere near as educated and uh, in, involved and experienced with the the themes that we're going to talk about today. So I appreciate your education. You're joining us here today and uh, really looking forward to your thoughts. Uh, Father Ripperger, if you don't mind, why don't we start with you? I'm guessing you've gotten maybe some uh, interesting questions in the last few days, weeks, months, where Hollywood has, has brought up uh, Father Gabriel Morth and the Pope's Exorcist movie. I'm interested, uh, what's your experience been like here recently? Yeah, I'm getting a lot of uh, questions. Actually, I get a lot of questions, especially in relation to Nefarious as well. But this, the the, the movie, I think they call it Real Factual Sports, right? I actually have not seen it because as soon as I watched the uh, the uh, trailer, or I didn't bring myself to pay that much attention to it because it just seemed like the typical Hollywood kind of sensationalist. I did talk to some extras that have seen it. And they said, yeah, it's pretty much straightforward sensationalism. And I was kind of sad, especially in light of the book, Tan is about to put out here, is coming out on Gabriel's life, actually uh, portrays it very clearly. And I think that um, it's unfortunate because one of the things that I've noticed a lot of the people in Hollywood is, is that, you know, they do all this stuff that sensationalized. But the real interesting stories in exorcism and even in the life of more, you read some of his books, the real interesting stuff is not in the sensational stuff. It's in the lessons we learn catechetically or about our Lord or later. But I think with a uh, missed opportunity to portray a great man, a man who's considered the father of modern exorcism, and uh, it, it was just a, a missed opportunity in the movie. And Dad, you worked on... Uh, that book, for Tan Books, the uh, official biography of Father Gabriel Amorth, the Pope's exorcist. And uh, so you're you're involved in, and know plenty of the background as well. What's your experience been with the the movie and the the conversation? Right. No, I, I agree with Father. I mean, it's uh, the movie. The trailer itself was it showed you the direction they were going to go. It's very sensational. You know, the old the old saying, if it bleeds, it reads. And so if they make it sensational, more people will see it. But I don't think it's really conforming to the, the life of this man who really was just a, a very simple priest in one sense. But also what I didn't know, I learned much about him um, through the process of doing the content editing on this book, um, preparing it for an American audience. I mean, he was a he was a soldier. He fought against he fought against fascism. Um, he was a Mariologist. He was a Paulist. He didn't get called into this uh, the Ministry of Exorcism until rather much later in his career. He walks into the. Uh, the chancellor's office, the chancellor of the diocese of Rome, just to kind of visit. The chancellor says, have you heard of uh, the work of Father Am uh, Candido Amantini, who was the diocesan exorcist? He said, sure, I respect, I know him. I've read and seen some of his work. He's, I've, he's very respectable. He says, good. He gets out a piece of paper. He said, and, it, and he wrote down, you know, I hereby commission you as, as assistant exorcist uh, uh, under Father Candido. And so that's what began his career as an exorcist, which was, was quite interesting. He was you know, well into publishing and all the things that Paulist priests do. Um, but his, this was somebody who was under beneath the mantle of the Blessed Mother from the beginning of his, from his very call to the priesthood all the way through. Um, and it was a very beautiful story. You get to see the human side. It doesn't have all the fantastical stuff, the, the phenomena of exorcism that an American audience likes, but it really gets you to see the humanity behind someone who really was um, groundbreaking in many ways, pioneering, because you're, you're coming off a of time theologically in the church both in the seminary systems, many in the hierarchy and academia, um, where any belief in the devil was considered, you know, superstition or old preconciliar beliefs and all these other things, not not something for the modern progressive mind. And so for him to go in, uh, in his very first session, as father uh, notes in his training of priests, often your very first case is going to be one of your toughest cases. His very first case, he gets a, uh, the, the person that was a young farmer, uh, he levitates. And so father finishes the prayer puts a stole over him, says amen, and, and the levitation completely stopped. And he never saw it again in his whole career. So so you see some some of the stories of what he went through, but what you get is the real human side, how much the, the whole person of Father Amorth is portrayed in the book. And you're not going to get that. Hollywood's not going to get into that. 
they certainly don't want to see a, a priest battling it, going into the woods and battling against fascism, you know. So, so they're going to focus on the on the, the, the fantastical stuff, but not the real Father Amor. So, I think the the Tan Book is an excellent resource. Well, the book's always better than the movie, <laughs> almost a hundred percent of the time. I guess it holds yeah. true in this case as well. Uh, Father Ripperger, what do you take away from Father Amor's work most? Um. Not just in his biography, but each else contained in there is um, how well he understood this kind of work, how hard he worked at it, the consistency of it, and also the dedication to it, especially in a time when, um, again, alluding to it, especially in a time when this stuff is simply ignored by the majority of the, of the theologians and uh, academics, as well as bishops and priests. So I think that the thing I I took away most from um, reading his biography before I wrote the introduction for it or forward, but was the fact that this was the, this was obviously a man of deep prayer, very consistent in his priesthood throughout the whole of it, and um, also the merit side, which does kind of come out a little bit in his books, but not like it does in biography. Interesting. And then, how, if at all, does it, what he did? apply to what you, you guys are doing today, Father? Well, you know, when I was first an exorcist, um, the core book that I started reading was actually Father and Morris, because he would break all the different kinds of eyeball influence. He had some very elementary counsel on what to do and what not to do. Um, obviously, it didn't contain the fullness of his wisdom knowledge in that. But he, uh, it was his original writing that gave me the sense of, okay, this is what an exorcist is supposed to do. This was 17 years ago before there were many people even writing in this area. And so he was one of the few scores out there. The first was in the beginning of the Rich Nolan and Note, especially, in the, and I think you would say the Pino Tana, the new right of exorcism, but in the old right of exorcism, they say that you really uh, should study the approved authors. And he was one of the few that you could read and know that at least as far as the practical side of things, and, and is also in relationship to um, the distinction among how do you behave, what kind of biology you know you're, you're on smaller ground. Dan, what about you? You have a very interesting background. Uh, you're now a, a professor of theology, but before that, a, a U.S. Army attack helicopter pilot, combat veteran, and now part of Father Ripperger's exorcism team. Yeah, no, I, I, you, we all bring to to the spiritual life, the, 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 our past, good and bad. So for me, reading Father Remorth as a combat veteran and now having worked in the, this this apostolate uh, and, and various models uh, and, and and seen various ways of this being done over the past 10 years. Um, I, I, I so I read Father Remorth quite differently and I have a lot of. I overlap because he was also a combat veteran from World War II, you know, so, so, uh, so he was a young soldier as well at those times. And those are very formative times, as Father will tell you, early in the priesthood, this is why um, in tradition, priests are, are, are usually taken from young men. And so that's very formative, those early years. And so my formative years were in the military and then theological formation later um, in kind of that, my doctoral training uh, in, in, in biblical studies was sort of coterminous happening at the same time that I was working on uh, exorcism team. And so I was able to approach this both from the experience of the military as well as uh, uh, theology and my background in theology and scripture. So for me, it, it, it makes very, very clean sense uh, uh, spiritual combat. It's not something we should be afraid of. In fact, if you look at the early church, the image of the cross was seen as the tropion. We read this on Good Friday. The priest reads it on part of the uh, the the lit not the litany but the um, uh, the sequence on Good Friday. Um, the Pange Lingue, sing my tongue of the glorious battle where Christ was triumphant uh, on the tropion, the war memorial of the cross. The cross has always been the war memorial for Christians, the identity of who we are. And so uh, understanding that, seeing that, seeing real combat in physical time uh, helps me to, to, to help filter some of the things that we see in spiritual combat. But combat is combat. We fight an ancient enemy. And so uh, the same battle that Father Morth fought, the fathers fought, the middle Age priests fought. I mean, this is this battle has been going on for a long time. What we're trying to do is is bring back some 
some uh, good theology and, and bring some of the things back into Catholic norms uh, uh, that's consistent with the tradition of the church. Yeah, with your book, The Lever Christo Method, you have uh, the great line, we fight an ancient enemy and the ancient weapons are best. Father Rippinger, do you, do you consider yourself uh, a fighter, a battler? I would imagine um, a lot of people might react a little strangely to, to that thinking uh, going along with uh, being a priest. Um, yeah, I mean, it is. It, basically, I tell people that my uh, full time job is that I torture rational creatures, they're intelligent creatures. Uh, it is actually, and I think that um, Dan was mentioning, you know, bring some theology. I think that's one of the good things about him. Mort, Mort was one of the guys who bridged the gap between when the stuff was all going on in the 50s and the 60s and then collapsed the afterwards and then into today. But as far as uh, I, I don't know if I see myself so much as a warrior, as someone who's been kind of conscripted in this, to use uh, military language. You know, I, I never wanted to be an exorcist. I tell people I still don't want to be an exorcist, but every time I try and get out of it, I feel like the lady sucks me back in. So I keep doing it. But um, for me, I, think I see myself more as an academic. But I think that's actually one of the reasons why the Lord our meetings have me in this precisely to take what the tradition of church has always been in these matters and then apply it in modern context that actually give us, you know, a coherent and coherent understanding of the continuum of theology up to today. Well, I think that's one of the great things about modern technology, actually, kind of almost maybe uh, uh, counterintuitively, is that when we used to be boxed into uh, a network television or radio specific times, and if other people were going to hear your message, they either had to be with you in a room or they were limited to, to other constraints. Now on the internet, uh, I think we can have fuller discussions like this, and it's uh, you can get a much better understanding of where everyone is coming from, which is uh, another reason why I'm really appreciative of you, you guys joining us today. Dan, I was hoping you could uh, enlighten us now on how your book came about and the, just the Lieber Christo method in, in general. Yeah, about 10, I guess it's been almost 10 years now, but maybe seven years now, um, we were, I was involved with Kyle Clement, who's father's right-hand man and case facilitator. We were doing some training at the Pope Leo Institute, working with some of the lay teams. Um, and Kyle says, I want to form this group uh, called Libra Cristo. And, uh, um, you know, and, and it's to support Father Ripperger and, and for case management. Because what we found, there was there was major problems. And any anyone, any exorcist will tell you, some of the major problems are, the people that are coming to you aren't prepared. They don't have sufficient virtue. They have no understanding of prayer. They have they have they have a very weak will. Uh, they have no no real desire to have any sort of active agency in their own liberation. They come and say, "Pray over me, so I feel better." But at the same time, on the other side, so at the beginning there was a deficiency in many of the people wanting help. There was no way to real dis, to, to discern the psychological from the from the spiritual because some people just have psychological problems. They don't need. Uh, an exorcist, they need a therapist and they need they need to get their, their, their mental health in order. But on the other side, what do you do with um, post uh, aftercare when you do find uh, lead a soul and there's they are there's a liberation. What do you do with that soul? They become very attached to the to the exorcist and that's not healthy either. So our, our the model that that father developed that we helped to 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 work with and develop uh, uh, and put in put into practice is the, the four phase protocol and the book, the manual that that's coming out is our phase two of the four phases. So this is a catechetical journey, a catechetical walk through 12 steps um, that, that you can either do it for yourself or you could, uh, you know, our teams are also using this book um, as well for, for the catechetical portion of the four phase protocol. But again, we fight an ancient enemy. And so the ancient weapons are best, but the question is, what are those ancient weapons? Um, you know, Father Amorth says that one confession is better than 20 exorcism, exor exorcisms. Exorcism, I mean, confession is stronger than, is better than, uh, uh, confession is better than exorcism. Confession, you take souls from Satan. Exorcism, you re remove their bodies. So the most important thing is, is working on the state of grace and developing the, 
the level, sufficient level of virtue and holiness, that really makes the job of the exorcist much, much easier. By the time they get to the exorcist, which is our phase, well, the phase three is utilizing the parish priest. By the time they get to the exorcist, those cases are very rare. Father put in his introduction of the book, um, the last year that they did statistics, when he before he moved to the archdiocese, there were 600 cases that year came for, for assistance. Of the 600, 450 actually were discerned by Father and the team to, to have had uh, a, a obsession or higher some level of diabolical affliction of the 600 that originally came only three were actual possessions so the bulk of people can it can tap into the resources that are common to all of us the ordinary re the ordinary means which is confession the sacramental life virtue prayer mental prayer uh, meditative prayer down the road all these things uh, 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 a sacrificial uh, uh, theology or spirituality of suffering of offering up your suffering um, integrating your trauma uh, uh, with good mental health practices through a Thomistic understanding of the human person. All these things are very critical in the ancient way that we've always been battling against the, the enemy. And so the book kind of works those things in so the cases can now work themselves through this. And there's a, a determinative figure, there's an objective uh, criterion now to determine is this person, does he need prayer or do they just need more pastoral help? So they, they finish phase two. And then they cycle either back into pastoral care, into mental health care, or they cycle through into more more deliberate minor exorcism prayer. So this this is just one part of the of the package, but it's not written. I didn't write it with with our teams in mind. I tried to write it with two audiences. One was our teams, but also that any Catholic can pick this up and learn how to make. At the end of the day. The, the meat of this is a deep dive general confession. So where do you learn to remove the obstacles of grace? Where have I allowed permissions for the diabolic to get in my life? Where do I have unhealthy uh, habits, defects and virtue, that sort of thing? And that that is, a, is an integral part of liberation. Whereas before, um, uh, a lot, we would just pray over everybody and hope for the best. It was just kind of gunsling it. And sometimes it would take hours and hours and months and months and years and years and get very, we got a lot of movement, but not a lot of liberation because we didn't remove those attachment points. So this book is trying to identify those attachment points. Uh, uh, and so to help people self-identify um, those things and that greatly assists the work of the exorcist. And I want to get into some of those details with you in, in just a minute, Dan, but first Father Rippinger, I know in your foreword of the book, I saw that you, you wrote that people are always trying to, Get the easiest way through things. Find the easiest right. solution. Uh, how has that been your experience? Uh, well, I generally call it the McDonald approach. People want to drive up, get their exorcism, and then drive off without putting any effort into it whatsoever. But one thing, if anything, as being an exorcist has taught me is, is that the vast majority of the people who end up possessed and go through the process of the liberation, the real goal of God to sanctify them through that process. And that requires an awful lot of work. This is also true even in diabolical oppression and obsession, that they have to be able to be willing to do a lot of the work in order to kind of climb the way out. The two other things that we started noticing, and this is one of the reasons why this phase two is so important, uh, was first articulated by um, Kyle Clement, my assistant. He said, you know, one of the patterns he noticed in this is that everybody who is possessed has some area in their theology that is erroneous or that they're having a hard time giving a sign to. And as time went on, we began to find out that that was actually true. And so going through a catechetical process can help, help identify that so that the person can work on it before they even come to the session. Because as Dan mentioned, we have kind of front loaded a lot of this stuff because we would pray with people for months before we discover some little thing that he was, the demon was holding on, which could have been cleared up much earlier on. The other part of it is that we start to, to part of it that can be very helpful is, is for people to recognize that not just with possession, but even with obsession and oppression, but even in our more normal spiritual lives. There are areas of psychological compatibility that demons, when they tempt people, that they're influencing people, will develop and foster very often without the person even realizing that the demon is developing this psychological compatibility. So when you go, people go through six stages of liberation that occur and they become liberated in, from possession, you can actually look at the degree of psychological separation they have and actually pin where they are in those six stages 
just from that, if you know what you're looking at. But the beauty of this uh, stage two of the protocol is it, it helps identify where the areas of catechesis that need to be straightened out or what kind of psychological compatibility could be there. So that gets cleaned up. And then what we've found is the time that you actually have to pray over people, it's much more contracted. It takes less time to liberate them than it did you just start praying with them. Because if you just start praying with them, they get the relief, but then it stands out much longer because they get hidden areas. And a lot of times the demons know where they are, but they hide them. And so, whereas this is a more objective way to ferret those things out first, and then we can actually um, move forward. So this is one of the things that I think that um, you know, in, in all of this, just learn that God is really trying to purify the person and get them where they need to be, both spiritually, psychologically, morally, veteran their virtue, before actually liberated. And then once they're liberated, they can stand on their two feet. Very interesting stuff there for sure. Uh, Dan, I love the way that your book starts. And Father, you mentioned it in your foreword as well with the analogy to, to David and Goliath and the five smooth stones and then you talk about arming yourselves, ourselves with ancient weapons to fight an ancient enemy. And number one, I think applies to what Father was just talking about there, renunciation of evil influences. Well, first you have you have to identify those, right, Dan? Right. So so, you know, in the in the in the book of Revelation, it says that that um, the, the that the, the ancient the, the ancient enemy or the devil, uh, um, the accuser of our brethren, accuses the brethren day and night before the throne of God. And so what is he using to accuse us with? He's accusing us with areas of our lives that we've given him permission and access to um, through perhaps a past witchcraft you know, work or, or working with, you know, or, or immoral behavior first and, and six commandment violations are the most common. And so people first have to learn, look at those areas that they've allowed the enemy in. And sometimes those areas, like Father had alluded to, this is something that, that is largely ignored by, by most other models of liberation, and that is the psychological compatibility. So looking at those areas of trauma, um, what areas in their life do I have a woundedness? Wherever there is, you know, you can have a, a wherever there's a psychological obsession, that soul is very vulnerable to a spiritual oppression or even spiritual obsession. So cleaning up those areas of psychological trauma. The very first case that we had, uh, we were working through the, 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 the early, very early beta stages of the protocol. We had a case of a young woman that was that was uh, date raped at age 16. And, um, and she didn't even live in our diocese. She was the, she was the daughter of, of some people that came to us, but she was interested in help. So we, we were using the phase two book that's here that we're now uh, the manual. We actually just had that the trifold um, preparation for a general for confession by the, the Fathers of Mercy put out. So Kyle and I, Kyle kind of worked through with me. And, and so I was working through with this couple. We had her coming in on Zoom. The parents were there, but we put them through the protocol, 30 days of strict prayer, a media fast, the entire family construct is praying. This woman had, uh, she was at that time 26. She had been living with this obsession, spiritual obsession. It ha happened very quickly for most of her adult life since since that incident, that traumatic incident. We started working with her weekly. Parents, everybody, the whole family, siblings, the whole family starts praying. So she, so so she's praying and doing these prayers, and I'm working with her weekly, working on the psychological trauma. How do you integrate this? with you know with the suffering of Christ how do you how do you learn how to unite your suffering with Christ's suffering they're praying she's going back she goes back uh, to the church she's back in, into the state of grace and now she's growing and this is going this only takes about 6 8 weeks about 8 weeks in i said look i think you need to do a general confession there's a priest in your city that i know that that i know is is versed in minor exorcism you should go see him she shows up at the parish he's on a sabbatical for 6 months uh, six months. And so the father, the priest that's standing in says, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll be glad to hear your confession. She does a quasi general confession after this disciplined prayer, uh, uh, prayer regimen, the whole family's praying. And after about eight weeks, she goes to a priest. He just does his regular job as a priest. He hears her confession and anything else he may have done uh, um, in the internal forum. She comes out and is liberated from a, an obsession level of uh, uh, affliction. And is now uh, years later, a, you know, very successful nurse practitioner and has married and children, et cetera. So um, um, the point that God was really showing us was through these first initial cases, this actually works. And part of it is 
the imposition of order, the establishment of removing those areas that, I, that I'm having psychological compatibility with the enemy, um, that, I'm, that I'm, I'm exposing myself, my vulnerabilities, so that um, I can identify them. You can't hit a target if you can't see it. You know? so, so learning how to be more accurate in your prayer is very important. So, so we walked this case. We get our, The first case we put through receives a liberation. It had nothing to do with a, an exorcist or anything fantastic. It happened in the confessional. And it was, I think, the Lord's way of saying you're on the right path. This is, this is how the normal way for, for liberation takes place. Father, that kind of uh, reminds me of what we were talking about before. It, it doesn't sound that didn't sound like the easy way out. And uh, it sounded like uh, the, the work was put in to to get done what what needed to get done. Yeah, absolutely. I think that uh, two parts. Of it. The first is, is that, as I mentioned, God wants people to have to uh go through these struggles in precisely the reason it allows diabolical pressure, possession, sometimes even possession in a person's life is precisely through the process of the struggle that they'll develop virtue on a level that they normally wouldn't other develop. But I've also had people who we when I was first an exorcist, I did what I was trained to do, which is that you listen to people's story, it seems credible, and they don't seem like they're um, they have psychological issues when you go ahead and start praying with them. And so I had this one kid with this one woman where she was 15 at the time. And um, we said the prayer by the grace of God in like three or four days, she was actually liberated from uh, possession of a demon of fear. Uh, and then I told, I started out, she was 15 with her, with her mom and dad. They said, look, this is what you're going to have to get to start leaving a good Catholic life. Well, she was one of these people that just wanted to be cleaned up. She left. Um, about three months later, the parents said, we think she's possessed again. We do, uh, so I talked to her. It turns out shortly after we had liberated her, she went out and committed a sin. Part of this compatibility issue that she still deals with even to this day. It was part of the compatibility issue. And I told the parents at this point, I said, I don't think she's serious about cutting off this compatibility. But if one of the other priests in our society wanted to do it, I'd allow them to do it. So another priest did a week later. She was liberated. Again, she got cleaned up without having to really do any work on her own, which I think was God's mercy. But then she did it again, and she ended up doing something even worse after that. And so now I told her, well, we can't work with you until you go through this protocol because you've got to be able to um, break that compatibility. And I think that's the real danger with people that want to just get cleaned up right away and then just kind of go back to their normal life. In fact, you'll often hear people, oh, I just got rid of this so I can, so I can live a normal life. When they really should be thinking to themselves, well, God's calling me to a life that's above and beyond the normal life, right? And so I should be trying to create that level of virtue that is at that level that he's calling in direct proportion to the battle, the spiritual battle that he's asked me to fight. And so... I think a lot of times when you just start training with people right away, you get a higher rate of recidivism. We don't get people usually falling back because as they go through the protocol, they're developing virtue along the way, getting rid of all this stuff, which is what that manual is all about, getting rid of all these compatibilities, all these issues and areas of spiritual life that can cause the recidivism. Whereas if we, if we put them through the protocol, they go to that second place and they do that, go through that manual, then what's happening, once they are liberated, the odds of falling back are very slim. Dan, it sounds like this plays right into the, the medical model that you, you speak about in your manual, that it's not just a, a Band-Aid to heal. It's actually getting to the spiritual, psychological wounds, and then uh, – I guess that would be the good medical model these days, right? Then actually uh, healing and, and, and getting to the, the place that everyone needs to be. Right. The medical model is what is how Kyle and father established it. It's, it, it's um, you know, you've got your, 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 your exorcist is your heart specialist or your brain surgeon, you know, and most of the time they'll show up and they'll say, father, uh, this is the type of surgery I have. This is the, what I have. I've been looking it up on Google and this, this is what I need you to do for me so I can be liberated. And, uh, and it just doesn't work that way. It's absurd if you think of that. But, but we do that. This is what Father Moore said, and I quoted him in the book. Um, There's always a strong temptation for charismatics, sensitives and exorcists of finding the quickest way to heal by going outside of the common sacred means to obtain grace. 
Those who seek solutions outside of the ordinary channels of attaining grace, he says, unwittingly fall into the trap of magic. We try to just do this quick fix to alleviate the suffering. But in the medical model, you know, the, the, you know you've got your, your ex, exorcist as, your, as your, your brain surgeon, your heart surgeon, your general practitioner is your parish priest. People say, oh, no, I, there's, you, need a, you need the charism to drive out demons. No, if you're ordained, that's part of the tria munera the threefold office or of duty, obligations, responsibilities of the priesthood, the munus regendi. And so the, the priest has, the, has the, the, the duty to rule, to reign as part of uh, 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 in persona Christi, their, their, their sacerdotal ontological identity as priest. This is part of who they are. People will say, oh, that's clericalism. No, I don't think so. I think it's Catholicism because this is the way Christ has established the hierarchy of the church. And so the third phase is working with the parish priest who has his own his his own authority over the individual uh, as pastor and as Roman Catholic priest. And so the second phase, the first and second phase, you've got the lay associates. We assist in the prayer sessions, but we're we're hero support. The heroes are the are the are the exorcists and the parish priest. And so, you know, we're the nurses, we're the, the the prep staff, you know, the that are getting them ready. I jokingly tell the cases that I work with, I'm sorry, but I'm nurse ratchet, you know, and, and you're not gonna get through to see father until you get through and do what we're asking, you know, like she told no cigarettes, right? I mean, so so you know, you gotta have the lay people and we give some some distance between the, the, these cases and the priest and work them through many, many times we would sit down before the protocol. We would get the person prepared for prayer. And I would always ask, so did you go to mass this weekend? And they'd say, oh, no, the demon wouldn't let me. The demon wouldn't let me. Did you go to confession? No, the demon won't let me. The priest comes out. They pray a lot of movement, a lot of activity, no liberations, no liberations because they weren't in a state of grace. Their soul wasn't in position, didn't have the merit to receive the graces. God can work outside of that. But the norm is that state of grace is very critical for liberation to, to the reception of this sacramental. Father Rippinger, I wonder if you could comment on that, that concept, the, the quote that sticks out to me that is the magic part of that. I imagine that's a pretty common misconception that you deal with. Yeah, it is. And I think Dan's description of it is we should I go from more than right. I was always looking for a quick, easy fix. And it's usually um, the normal drawing that an activist experiences. I think that one of the things when you read uh, a more life, you realize he had some cases of drug out well. It takes uh, sometimes years to liberate people. And that it's it's a big it's a grind. I have seen many priests who started being exorcists, they'll get a case that starts grinding for a while. And instead of just resorting to prayer, especially asking our lady of stars specifically under that title, reveals to me what I'm supposed to do. And usually like this would come in an ordinary way. We're not looking for something charismatic. But she would just give the grace the exorcist to see this is what actually needs to be done at this point. But instead of grinding it out, being willing to take the time that God had preordained regarding the person who growth and holiness, they want to do this quick fix. And so I've actually seen exorcists do one of two things. Um, oh, actually, three obvious nursing exorcists didn't know that you have to grind it out and praying, asking for uh, the gift of knowledge, give you the understanding of these things, okay. Or to get this counsel on what to do, right? Okay. But the, a lot of times, sometimes I've seen actually just because demons will start suggesting in session, when they're talking, they say, oh, well, you have to do X, Y, and Z, and that's those things are actually contrary to the first commandment or contrary to the teaching of the church, and actually just will have been intensively involved in psychologically in the case, and then they get fucked down the rabbit hole. And so they end up doing stuff that ends up making them out, or actually empowers the demon. Or the other thing is, is that they'll try and find somebody who um, reported has gift of um, discernment of spirit. You know, and so they'll say, you know, oh, I have the gift of discernment of spirits, but my experience, I've only, all the people that I've ever met that I, that claim to have the gift of discernment spirits, only one do I honestly believe had it. Most of the people that are intuitive, they might have a good sense of these things, but that doesn't mean that they actually have a gift which God reveals to them. So like in the case of the woman that I knew that actually had an authentic gift, you could say to her, I'm working with a woman who's 40 years old. She could then tell you 
how many demons there were, what parts of the body they possessed, how they got in, likely what's likely to get them out, and a variety of other aspects of the dynamics of the case. And whereas other people, it's really more of a human thing we're seeing more and more. That's the tendency towards magic is starting to occur, is where people are actually striving to get knowledge or answers or use methodologies which can quickly get this thing done rather than just being willing to suffer the process for the sake of your sanctification. And Dan, I imagine uh, with your experience along with Father Rippinger's, you learn to to separate those who are, are truly um, wanting and, and searching for the doing things the right way and then those who are looking for that quick fix or looking for the magic that you spoke about. Right. The magic that Father Moore's talking about isn't necessarily in the person that's, that's asking for help. It's in the practitioners. He says charismatic sensitives uh, and exorcists. And so they're often looking for a quick way out too. I've had priests will call and they'll say, hey, this person I had a priest call. This guy did this and he did this ceremony and he was in this cult group and then he did this satanic ritual and he starts describing all these horrible things. And he said, what what prayer should I pray to liberate him? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, it sounds to me. Um, I know a Jewish carpenter who was an exorcist that says this type only comes out through prayer and fasting. And he says, man, I'm doing so much fasting. I'm losing weight and, and on and on. I hardly eat. And I'm mortifying myself. And I said, Father, with all due respect, I wasn't talking about you. I was talking about that guy. He's the guy that did the ritual. He's the guy that, that offended God deeply with first commandment violations. But St. John Chrysostom, doc of the church, said that, that, that scripture applies to both the exorcist and to the, 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 the anergamon, the person that's afflicted. But it isn't the work isn't up to the exorcist. The exorcist and his team, we just are there uh, with pickaxe. This is this is spade work. This is grunt work. The, it's, it's, it, the work is done between the soul and God. And we're there uh, in support of the exorcist and, 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 so, and their, their role as, as, as ministers of, of, of the church uh, uh, in persona Christi. We're there to assist, but ultimately that mystery between Christ and the soul, you're not going to circumvent that. Sometimes God will allow the suffering of this person to stay there until he mines out all the graces of that suffering um, for not just for the individual, but for the whole family, the whole construct. When I'm doing intakes, I'm watching, you know, I was just a cab scout in the military. So I'm still just doing cab scout, cab scout work. I'm looking at the individual as coming to us for help, but, but in my, my alter vision, my side vision, I'm watching who in this family construct is in most need of salvation, whose soul is most gravely in danger, and then getting that person to connect their suffering to this soul. It could be the soul of those who abused them, the father who sexually abused them. It could be the soul of their ex-husband or their, their mother or whatever, a child that's suffering. God might be allowing you to suffer to pour out more grace into the entire familial construct, and that's just going to take time to work through. And Dan, you, you label this or subtitle this a field manual for spiritual combat. I'm wondering uh, what exactly you're hoping that people who pick up your book and read it can can take specifically. Is that is it that identifying that you just talked about? Yeah, I, I tried to walk you through. I use the analogy. I use a lot of analogies um, to help it make it understandable or make it interesting because this is not a textbook. This is a manual. Um, a manual is, is tactics. It's a tactical manual. So in combat, you have tactics, you have uh, 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 strategies, and then you have combat multipliers, right? A, a Cobra helicopter was a combat multiplier. It increased the multiplication. of It, it was a force multiplier. It, it increases the power, the fighting capacity. So We've got three books coming with Tan. This one is a tactical manual. This teaches you the hand-to-hand -hand tactics. Strategy is the bigger picture. That's the that's the primer that's coming out. Um, but the, this is a tactical manual. The the combat force the force multiplier is the book on the Blessed Mother, um, using and understanding why we hold her in such high regard. With hyperdulia says uh, the, the teachings of the church. Why do we hold her in this high regard? But this manual here is to give practical tactical advice, which is why I use you know uh, David and Goliath. I use Rogers rules for Rangers, which the U.S. Army Rangers uh, use. Uh, uh, some examples from from military experience, so you can see. This is this is how we fight in, in physical combat. Now, how do we do that? Father Amorth kicked things up. He he brought this back to the forefront. 
right? And so, and was very effective. But now the enemy changes, the battlefield shifts. Just like when we were in Iraq, you know, I witnessed the largest artillery barrage and the largest tank, uh, uh, tank engagement uh, from a helicopter watching it. I saw these things uh, in military history and the largest tank engagement since World War II. And now there's we hardly have tanks. We have no artillery because the enemy regrouped. They, they said, no, uh, we cannot beat the, the, the Americans in an open battlefield. So what do they do? They take off their uniforms. They hide behind civilians. They drew us into hand to hand combat. They went primitive. And so the military had to adjust and go back to a more primitive way of fighting. And I, the way I see this, again, as a scholar, as a military veteran, as someone who works with Father Ripperger and, 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 and work with cases locally as well, I see the battlefield shifting. And what this manual is doing is bringing us back uh, to practical Catholic norms that are workable, um, that, that's taking what Father has written, two beautiful works, The Psychology of Mental Health and Dominion, and trying to boil those down for the layperson to read those and go, oh, OK, that makes sense. That makes sense. And making it a, a practical, tactical manual for lay Catholics. Father Ripperger, did you see it in a, in a similar way, this book and, and what people could take from it? Uh, yeah, exactly. I think that it's really it's a, it's a practical uh, work, which I think is very beneficial. And I think it also it, it does inform obviously because it gives you a sense of what the battlefield actually looks like, what the dynamics are on the battlefield, and also what your response needs to be in relationship to what battle is going to entail. I think one of the biggest mistakes people make is thinking that. You know, spiritual warfare is highly predictable. There's not much that you can do. It just rely entirely on God, although that, that's true, but in a different way. And so they tend to think that, you know, you just you just have to pray God gets you through the thing. Well, one said it's true, but demons are extraordinarily consistent. They, they, they act always almost the same way because their nature didn't change. They're still locked into a specific way of thinking. And then God regulates how much interaction and how that interaction occurs. They're very predictable. But that also means then so is the battlefield. And so this is, I think, one of the beauties of the manual. It actually provides people with the practical side of what they need to do to engage that battle effectively. And Dan, towards the, the end of the book, in the conclusion, you, you have a quote that stuck out to me talking about warriors now and fighting on the battlefield of faith. The true soldier fights not because he hates what's in front of him, but because he loves what is behind him. What do you hope people take from from that? Yeah, I, I think uh, the, the point of that, the Chesterton quote, um, that that we have to fight out of love. We have to fight out of love for our families. We have to fight out of love for our children. We have to regroup as Catholics and put first things first. And so I'm, I, I, I want men in particular to see this is where we're fighting. You know, when I looked at my enemy, the Iraqi army uh, uh, many years ago, uh, yeah, there's a certain amount of animosity towards them. But the true soldier, I'm not out there because I hate them. I'm out there because I love this country. I love my family. I love the people that are behind me, that I've left behind. And the spiritual combat needs to be the same way. We need to do this out of love for our families, love for the church, right? I also put a quote in there from the Common of Martyrs, Office of Readings. We are warriors now fighting on the battlefield of faith, and God sees all that we do. The angels watch, and so does Christ. What honor and glory to do joy, to do honor, glory, and joy to do battle in the presence of God and to have Christ approve our victory. Let us arm ourselves in full strength to prepare ourselves for the ultimate struggle with blameless hearts, true faith, unyielding courage, what honor and glory and joy to do battle in the presence of God and to have Christ approve our victory. So, so I, I just want to encourage Catholics not to focus on the devil, you know, because that becomes very, very easy in this particular um, uh, apostolate or ministry for the priest is to focus on what the devil's doing and all the supernatural things. Know that we're battling an ancient battle. The catechism says this has been our battle. Man's, that man's history is one of dour combat from the beginning of time until the end of time, says the catechism. So what, what joy, what joy to do battle, you know, like the Maccabeans, uh, it says they battled Judas and his brothers battled joyfully the wars of the Lord. And so how do we do that and be joyful in what we do and not focus on what the devil's doing? Let's focus on what Christ is doing and fight for the right reasons. Father Ripperger, you get uh, that takeaway from the Chesterton quote as well about battling not what's in, in front of you, but what's behind you. 
Yeah, absolutely. In fact, as an exorcist, you can't you can't even have hatred even for the demons in a certain sense. Although it's kind of mixed the scripture with the perfect take I hate and some of the fathers take that reference that this actually is a reference to with the demons we have to have perfect um, turning away from them, it just uh, you can't love them, obviously. But the point is that the real issue is you see this even in the person who's battling it, and even in the life of the exorcist, is it's an opportunity to grow in love of God because in addition to things being revealed about the saint and God, which is the real issue and stuff, all the stuff that people see on Hollywood, yeah, we've seen that, but it's not the type of stuff that's really interesting. What's interesting is how good God is in this process, how merciful it is, how beautiful and wonderful the saints are, and how powerful some of the angels are, etc. And so there's a real love that you start to grow for God. And ironically, even though you're in the midst of battle, um, I, you, basically over the course of time, as an exorcist, you actually become more meek because you have to reframe your appetite war because the demons will kind of pick at that. But in point of fact, the demons want you to hate them because they want your focus to be on them, even if it's bad. And as long as it's not on God, whereas if your focus is entirely on God, even the process, then you become quasi-immune to their attacks and to what they're, what they're trying to achieve in your life. And so in the end, it's really more about our love of God and God and building a charity. Because as an exorcist, this is this is a quasi spiritual work of mercy and a quasi corporal work of mercy. So it's uh, as an exorcist, and so ultimately it's rooted in charity, or at least it has to be if it's worked. In, it's rooted in the priest helping the guys, but then it's going to be a big problem. But over the course of time, you begin to realize you have to attach it. Even from when the demons ridicule you, even when they say certain things, you just become detached from what's going on for, you know, with them and their lives. And you're not focusing on, you know, the fact that these things are causing you a tremendous amount of damage, not you necessarily to catch this, although they do attack you. But the person that you're working with, whether your focus comes on what good is God going to show regarding himself in this process. In that vein, I guess we could see uh, Hollywood's bringing uh, this issue to light, even though not ideal, maybe a net positive, Dan. Well, I, th I, well, I think they're, they're trying to capitalize on it. Uh, there, there is, across the board, a general increase in the supernatural, you know, and, and, and the diabolic. I, I've said before that as we become as a nation and, as a, and that really as worldwide, as we become uh, post-Christian, uh, we're nature abhors a void, so does supernature and preternatural. The preternature abhors, abhors a void. And so to be post-Christian, we're now becoming neo-pagan. And so we're, we see this an, a, a, surgence, a resurgence of neo-paganism and other forms. And people are, they don't know what to do. So look into Hollywood and, and Hollywood's giving them, you know, they're selling movies because they're fantastic. Uh, we, you know, I think there's nothing fantastic about, there's no stories in this manual. This is just a basic grunt manual, a military type manual, pick this up. This is how you get out of this situation. This is how you walk your way through. If you notice in the table of contents, there's 12 lessons, the 12 lessons, the exact middle lesson is the Blessed Virgin Mary. Um, you know, the, she is absolutely uh, the key. In the military, the infantry is known as the queen of battle. And so understanding of what a warrior queen is, why she has such a high place of hyperdulia, uh, a high place of honor, uh, of her wife, Canon Law says that we should all have a filial devotion to her, her role uh, in liberation, walking up to that point and then going into a general deep dive confession um, based on, on um, you know, what Father Ripperberg has put together in his deliverance prayers for the use of laity and other, other sources, uh, identifying defects uh, in virtue, um, identifying areas of repeated sin, getting the soul clean, and then learning the clean from the unclean, getting the habit of prayer in place, and then starting to introduce how to do Lectio Divina and mental prayer. These are all essential areas of combat, the way the church has always battled the enemy. So it all, there, there's, a, there's an inner logic you know, into the progression of what this book walks the reader through. And, uh, and so far, we've, we've had good success in some of the beta trials we've done with, with different cases.
That's certainly good to hear. And it uh, seems like a, a, a good way to, to wrap this up. Father Ripperger, anything you would like to add? Um, no, just that I'm very appreciative of Tan publishing it. And also I'm very appreciative of Tan having put out uh, the biography of Amorth. I think they'll both be very good contributions. I think the biography of Amorth is, that you're putting out is very timely given the movies that people have a balanced view of and find out what the real man is like. But then also this field manual, I think, will do a lot of people a tremendous amount of good. Well, really appreciate you guys joining us here today. Uh, Father, if you don't mind, why don't we conclude with a prayer? Sure. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou, most women, and blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death, amen. Benedicto Deum, Potentis, Padres, et Filio, et Spiritus Sancti, Shed, et Supervos, et Maria, et Semper, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father Ripperger. Thank you, Dan, uh, for both your work, your time today, and your contributions to this uh, TAN conversation. We really appreciate all that you've done. Thank you, Tim. Mm-hmm.